Let's say you came up with this really cool looping idea. In fact, it's so cool you don't ever want to not do it again. But at the same time, you don't want to bore your listener and maybe yourself absolutely senseless in the process. Last time we talked about writing B sections and how it can be a really effective way to break up the monotony when you have a really cool idea but don't know what to do next. But the reality is you don't always need a B section. It's pretty common now to use texture and production techniques and vertical layering to achieve variation rather than the actual thematic material or progressions themselves. This is really not a new concept per se. If you're familiar with something like Ravel's Bolero, you understand that he used orchestration and texture and things like that to achieve variation, while the progression and the main thematic material pretty much keeps repeating. So we're going to take some of those same things that he used in an orchestral sense and apply them to production. Now the obvious drawback to this sort of technique is that it's, it's really, really repetitive. repetitive. And we really need to find something that will complement the loops and give them a sense of progression to make this sound like an arrangement and not just a pattern that keeps repeating over and over, even though it kind of is. To help with this, I use something I like to call subtractive arrangement. It's essentially where we build up all of the layers in the climax first, make sure that every piece of the puzzle fits together nicely, and then arrange outward, sort of inside out. And we do this by removing or subtracting elements as we get to the further edges of the piece or the track. And this gives the whole thing a more natural arc. So we really just need two main elements to make this whole thing work. We need the loop itself and we need the other stuff, the stuff that surrounds the loop, comes and goes and gives us a sense of direction in our arrangement. Now, obviously, the loop is kind of the main thing. If the loop isn't really strong, we are going to get tired of hearing it. We need a loop that can not only stand up to repetition, but kind of beg for repetition. We want to hear it again and again and again. And let's go inside the session of one of my older tracks. This is a track called As of Old that I wrote back in 2018, I believe. And it uses this exact method. I think it's a really good example of what I'm talking about. The whole thing started with this sequence. And guess what? If I jump to anywhere in this piece, that's gonna be happening. with more delay. So you can hear I'm doing some things with the sound design to open up the filter on that particular synth sequence and give it some shape dynamically, as well as adding effects. I think there's some flanger and some delay going on in there. The second element to the loop itself is the chord progression that happens underneath. It doesn't line up one for one with the sequence. It's offset just a little bit. Neither element is incredibly complex, but I think by shifting the offset of the start of the chord progression with the sequence in an interesting way, it gives the whole thing more life. And this is just part of the process. It took a little longer to figure out how to fit those two elements together in a way that was interesting to me and that worked harmonically really well. But that's kind of part of the fun to me is figuring out how to put the pieces of the puzzle together. By the way, if you want to see me actually write music like this from scratch, start to finish, I actually have a composition course now that teaches this type of arrangement, as well as some more linear traditional forms of arrangement and composition like we looked at in that B section video. That's going to be linked down in the description if you want to take a closer look at it. No obligation, it's just something to give you more in-depth analysis of the kind of stuff I talk about on this channel. So I use this displaced sequencing technique quite a lot, and a lot of times I like to do it with tape loops where things never line up exactly the same way twice. And I also do it with synth sequences that are in odd meters. So like one thing will be in four, another thing will be in five. <laughs> That 
that's an interesting way to get more mileage out of looping ideas because you never hear them exactly the same way twice, or at least very seldom do you hear them. So now we have our looping pattern that's gonna anchor this whole thing down and never change. But if I just let you hear that, over and over, just like that, even with the dynamic and sort of textural changes that take place, it's gonna get boring over the course of, I don't know, three minutes, however long this song is. I need something that's gonna provide like narration over this story, right? And to do that, I use a piano melody over the top of this looping idea at the beginning. I break the monotony and sort of break out of this looping idea by just taking it higher the next time. And this is kind of that linear concept that we talked about in the last video. So just by adding that element, it's already more interesting and has more linearity to it. It has more of a sense of direction. Now, my favorite thing, my favorite element in this entire piece are Olivia's vocals, which are just layered, straight tone soprano vocals, absolutely incredible tone, a testament to a musician taking something that you write and just transforming it into something more than you imagine. And she has all these kind of like sigh motives that happen over the top of this loop. This is where the subtractive arrangement thing sort of starts to come into play. You can hear how all of these things are entering at different times. Whereas when I wrote it all, I sort of lined everything up together so that I could see how all of the pieces of the puzzle would fit. So if we get over to the climax over here, we have all of these elements in at their biggest point and all of these vocal parts that are stacked on top of each other that I wrote out to work together and then sort of thinned out as we moved outside uh, to the outsides of the arrangement. Of course it distorts because I have no idea what I was doing at this particular time in my life. <laughs> oh, those vocals are so good. I comped these vocals, in other words, I put all the parts together. It was like several takes that I put together uh, in another session. So that's why it looks very clean here. I just took the stems out from that session and imported them in here. Uh, so I still had some flexibility, but not the paralyzation of so many choices to make in this big session. So as you can hear, we just have like one element, one vocal line from that. Now in the biggest section of this, you'll hear it open up and it sounds like I'm adding a ton and it's really not all that much. I'm really just using all of these piano percussive ostinato layers as our percussive elements. The same core elements are happening underneath, but all of this rhythmic stuff in the pianos are happening as well. So everything together as we build into the climax sounds like this.
remove all of those layers, what remains? The loop. So underneath everything, no matter what is going on above it to give the whole thing shape and direction, that loop persists. It's always present. Through the use of subtractive arrangement, using some melodic stuff in the piano to give it a sense of phrase and direction, the whole thing has a sense of purpose, a sense of direction, and it's gonna hold the listener's interest far more than just a couple of elements that just loop over and over. Most importantly, it still tells a musical, emotional story, just with things like texture and production and sound design and instrumentation, rather than the actual chord progressions or melodic ideas changing too much themselves.